was born of Lebanese parents in Liberia in West Africa. I went to Lebanon when I was very young. Uh, I was a few years old. My parents decided that it was best for my mom to send my siblings and I to Lebanon to go to school there. And my dad stayed behind tending the business. And he would come to visit us as his business permitted. Um, I grew up in a civil war in Lebanon. When I was very young, my dad came home from Africa for the last time. He was eaten up with cancer. And I loved my father to the uttermost limits that a human being can love another. I wouldn't let him out of my sight. When he was around, I was his constant shadow. And when I was eight years old, he was eaten up with cancer. He went to the hospital, and that was the last time I saw him. He died, and I wasn't allowed to go to the funeral. My mother wanted to protect me. And for many years to come, I cried myself to sleep. I was mad with God and I asked him, why did you take my father away from me? And after my father died, the Lebanese Civil War began, and it was neighbor against neighbor. It was Christians against Muslims. And I grew up as a product of my, of my surroundings. I was filled with hatred. And I had become desensitized in the war to violence and bloodshed. I would go to fronts uh, when they were quiet in the war. And it wasn't good enough for me to wait for the action, but I was addicted to violence. Uh, when there was nothing going on at the front, I would start sniping so we could have some action. I was like a blood, like a drug addict waiting for the next fix to satisfy my animalistic urge for violence. And one day I was at the military front on a peaceful Sunday and I heard the church bells toll signaling Sunday worship on the Christian side. And without hesitation, I knew exactly what I had to do. I took a sniper rifle with a long scope and I aimed it at the man tolling the church bell on the Christian side. And I thought, surely Allah was smiling at me. And when I had his head in my crosshairs, I pulled the trigger. And to my utter dismay, I saw the bullet smoke the wall inches above his head as he ducked down with the toll of the bell at the last millisecond. And he left me distraught because I thought I had missed the opportunity of a lifetime. And I lamented that all was lost because of my reckless arrogance and miscalculation. I thought only if I had aimed at his heart instead of his head, I would have surely got him. Then I thought maybe Allah wasn't smiling at me after all. There were many instances in the war when I should have died. And being around weapons, we joked with them a lot. At one time, my brother, thinking the AK-47 assault rifle to be unloaded, he pointed it at my chest. And laughing and joking, he pulled the trigger. It wasn't unloaded. But miraculously, the bullet did not fire. There was another time when my company and I were trapped behind enemy lines. And news got to my mother that we were, we were dead and miraculously were able to escape away unharmed at dawn. Another time, I was planting mines in a field adjacent to the front. When I stepped on a mine, I had just planted. And to my utter dismay, I knew that the millisecond I took my weight off that bomb, it was surely going to explode and blow me into, into oblivion. And I spoke to God that day. He must have heard me, for I stepped away unharmed. There were many such instances like this. One time we were at the front and the enemy forces were, were showering us with bullets and I took a hand grenade. We feared they were advancing into our position. I took a hand grenade and I threw it in front of me. And I realized that it landed in the tree right next to me. And I had no place to go as we were being showered with bullets. So I ducked and I, I braced for the explosion. But the explosion never came. Such was the hatred that brewed in my heart. 
And when it was quiet on the front, we would speak to Christians on the other side on CB radios. And the name of the game was to blaspheme everything that they held sacred. And the names that often came to my lips during those vulgar exchanges were those of Jesus, Mary, and the priests. At that time, I thought I believed in God and that he sanctioned hatred. After my brother Sam was injured in the war, my mother was determined to get us out of the country. But I couldn't leave the country because I was at the military drafting age. And so my mother procured some paperwork that I needed to leave the country temporarily to go to Cyprus for an eye surgery. My eyes were fine, but she wanted to try and get me out of the country. And I had become disillusioned with the war in the killing fields, and I wanted to see what else life had to offer. I wanted to one day marry and have children. I wanted to see the world. I took that paper that my mother gave me and I showed it to the Lebanese army at the airport. And um, it was saying that I was going to Cyprus, but my ticket said that I was going to Spain. But miraculously, they let me go. And on the day that I left my ancestral land, I had no illusions about the heart of man. I saw the darkness in my own heart, and I saw it in others around me. And when religion tells you that man is basically good, it is a lie of colossal dimensions, for there is nothing redeeming about mankind. And it was in Houston, away from the sound of exploding artillery, the constant view of death, and the smell of gunpowder, that I met Jennifer. And it was love at first sight. And two weeks later, I was talking marriage. Jennifer is a person who deeply loves the Lord, but Jennifer, it so happened by divine intervention that she was the only Southern Baptist who had never heard of that verse in 2 Corinthians 6.14 that says that you must not be unequally yoked. And so she agreed to marry me on one condition, that we would go to church as a family, that our children would also grow up in church. And I agreed. So Jennifer and I eloped five months after we met. I went to church with her because I thought it was a win-win. I was raised to believe that the Bible was corrupted. And I thought this would give me a chance to disprove the Bible by learning more about it. And so I went to church with her for the wrong reasons. And over the course of two years, I read the Bible twice, from cover to cover, trying to disprove it. And it was, it was a few months uh, after we began going to Second Baptist Church that Jennifer discovered through one of Dr. Ed Young's sermons, Ed Young Sr. in, in Houston at Second Baptist Church, that we were unequally yoked. Surprise, surprise. She came to me and she said, Jerry, I wish you were a Christian. Well, I flat out told her that I was born Muslim, I was going to die Muslim, and that there was nothing she or anyone else could do to change me. I mean, me become a Christian? What an irony. You know, not only did the Christians fire on me in Lebanon in the Civil War, but newsflash, Jesus was a Jew. And if I hated Christians, I hated Jews 10 times more. So I laid down the law and I told Jennifer that I will never convert to Christianity. Jennifer began to listen to a series by Focus on the Family with Dr. James Dobson, titled Beloved Unbeliever. And she learned that you cannot shove the gospel down anyone's throat but that you have to be Christ with skin on. You have to love them unconditionally. And you have to pray. And Jennifer began to pray. And it was the Lord who said in Matthew 17, 20, if you have faith as a mustard seed and you say to this mountain, move, it will move. In other words, the impossible with man becomes possible with God. 
And as Jennifer continued to pray, as I continued to examine the scripture, I came across some revolutionary teachings. You see, in the 99 excellent names of Allah in Islam, not one is love, not one is Father. But I read about a God who loved mankind so much, even after they rebelled against Him, that He made a covenant with them to send His Son to pay a price that we couldn't afford. So that I, even I, who rebelled against Him, can come before the very Creator of the universe and call Him Baba, which is Daddy in Arabic. And this revelation rocked my world. And it was uh, after I became intellectually convicted that Jesus is the Son of God that one day in church after Dr. Young gave the invitation that I silently cried out to God and I said if this is the true way to you and if Jesus is really your son if you want me to accept him as my Lord and my Savior and reject my religious heritage then I want you to give me a physical sign and it was a few minutes later as we were leaving the church. We had left through one set of doors into the parking lot. And then I heard someone running behind me anxiously and enthusiastically saying, welcome, welcome. And I kept on going. And then I felt the tap on my shoulder. And as I turned around, someone took me by my arm and he looked me in my soul. And he said again with passion, welcome, welcome. As I looked into the eyes of Dr. Young, I said, surely this is God's messenger and Jesus is God's. And it was as if my whole life came flashing before my very eyes, as if the very scales fell from my eyes and I could see for the first time. I could see that God had me in the palm of his hand, protecting me and guarding me all these years for such a time as this, when I who blaspheme his holy name can come before him and call him up. And the very next Sunday, without saying a word to Jennifer about my secret prayer, when Dr. Ed Young gave the invitation, I ran down that aisle. This ex-militant Muslim left his baggage of hatred behind. And I ran down that aisle and I said, I want this Jesus in my life who died on the cross for me. And when I said yes to Jesus, it was as if I could cry out with the Apostle Paul in one voice in 1 Timothy 1, 13 through 14. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet... I was shown mercy. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Gave my life to him. I also died. And he began living in my human shell. And it was after I went home that my brother Sam called me to find out, to ask me what had I done. And I explained to him, I told him of the one, the only one who ever died on a cross for him, the one who loved him more than father or mother or brother or sister. And Sam went with us to church to see what was happening to his brother. And on that day, Sam gave his life to the Lord. And for 11 long years, for 11 years, I wept to my Father in heaven for the soul of my mother and I asked her, Mama, isn't it time that you know that you know that you have eternal life? Because a Muslim lives their entire lives fearing the day of judgment, not knowing 
on which way the scales of justice will tip, on the way of virtue or vice. And this time, after all these years, my mama did not mock me. This time she said yes. And as I knelt beside her and I led her through the sinner's prayer, and it was a few months later that my mama discovered that she had terminal cancer. And she wanted this Bible. This is the Bible I used to read her when she was ill. And then when I couldn't take the pain of watching her suffer anymore, I silently cried out to God. And I said, Lord, if you're not going to heal her, then I want you to take her home this very night. And before the night was over, I saw her lift up her arms to the ceiling with all the strength that she had. I heard her say her last words in Arabic. Ah, you came for me. And she went to be with the Lord.